Okay, guys, let's welcome our third speaker of tonight's wonderful colloquium. It's Jeremy Kawahara, and he will tell us about his research in medical imaging. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about spinal cord segmentation in multiple sclerosis patients. Uh, I work in the medical image analysis lab. Uh, so to give you a little bit of background, um, why would we want to study this? Uh, so it's been shown in studies that the level of multiple sclerosis, uh, the physical disability in multiple sclerosis patients uh, correlates with spinal cord atrophy, where atrophy is defined as uh, the loss of tissue in the spinal cord. Um, so it's been suggested that if we can quantify this spinal cord atrophy, this might be a useful biomarker to allow us to uh, monitor the progression of diseases or uh, the effectiveness of therapies. So this brings up the question of how can we accurately um, measure the spinal cord. It's uh, difficult for radiologists to measure it. Um, there's, they have a lot of M uh, MRIs. The MRIs are three. It's an easy problem. Um, so today I'm going to present to you two uh, different segmentation approaches uh, that we've been working on. Um, so the first one will be on uh, it's called globally optimal spinal cord segmentation using a minimal path in six dimensions. So just to make sure that we're all clear what segmentation is, uh, I, I think of it as a labeling problem where you have, um, a, you have a, an image with voxels and you want to mark some of those um, as your object and some of them as background. So here we have the spinal cord uh, marked in the red and um, the background there. So to talk a bit about the, the method, um, so I'll first talk about the shape. Uh, we can represent two-dimensional axial slices of the spinal cord using principal component analysis. Um, if we restrict ourselves just to using three principal components, we can uh, make the shape change and vary, as you can see um, in this top image here. Um, so we can represent a shape with six numbers, essentially, uh, where three represent uh, the spatial coordinates. Uh, and three re would represent the actual shape. Um, so given a start and an end point, we can find um, a path in the six dimensional space and that will represent our um, segmentation. So to try to give some intuition of what that uh, path that the segmentation really means, um, we can think of a slightly simpler case where say we want to segment a tubular object so we can represent uh, an object with a sphere. Um, with a radius. So if uh, we have a set of points here where this would be like radius of one, radius two, radius of three, uh, if we start here, we can say we're at this particular location as a radius of two, as a ra uh, change location as a radius of one, change location again, radius of one, uh, change spatial location, radius of two, uh, spatial location, radius of three, and so on. So I'll give you uh, an overview of the pipeline. Um, so we start out by having, we have training data, which is um, uh, a human's gone through and marked out where the spinal cord is. We use apply PCA to learn the shape space, and we can make different axial slices um, that look like that. And then at runtime, a user would enter a start point and end point. Um, and starting from the starting point, we would create a shape. And then we would check, I don't know how well you can see that, but check how well it fits the image data, um, and then get a score based on how well that shape fits the image data at that location. That score then becomes essentially the edge weight. Um, if we stack all these 2D, 2D uh, slices, we can get a three-dimensional three segmentation, uh, where we end up with this list of numbers, where the numbers represent our segmentation. Um, and the first three numbers represent the spatial coordinates, the x, y, z coordinate of the center of our shape, and the last three represent the, uh, the shape itself, what it looks like. Um, so one of the kind of challenges with this is you end up with this huge shapes, uh, huge area to search. So I tried to kind of give a sense of that here. Um, if we think of, if we just had a three by three cube, if we uh, expand this to six dimensions, you can see in the, in the gray we go to four dimensions, green's five, blue is six. We get very quickly, we get a very big area to search. Uh, another way to visualize that I tried to show here is for every um, uh, 3D pixel, you have also three dimensions representing the shape. 
So this was, this was kind of a big challenge, is how to deal with graphs this big. Um, so we had two kind of insights that helped with that. One is that we could massively prune a lot of the edges in this graph. Uh, a lot of the paths don't really make sense. Um, second is that uh, we don't actually have to create the graph with all the edges prior to runtime. We can actually infer the edges at runtime. And that will drastically <laughs> drop the uh, memory from like over 100 gigabytes to 110 gigabytes uh, by doing that. Uh, so some results. How well does this work? Um, on the left, we can see where it, it worked actually pretty reasonably well. Green is where <coughs> it has marked as spinal cord, and red is where this method has, uh, has determined spinal cord. Uh, on the right, we can see that, um, uh, that area where it didn't work out so well, particularly here where it's latched onto um, the wrong boundary. Um, and again, you can see that on the sagittal slice here where it's, uh, again, it's on the wrong boundary. Um, so, so this, these types of problems where these, where these uh, it would latch and wrong boundary kind of motivated our next approach uh, for segmentation, which was a very different uh, a machine learning approach. Uh, we call it uh, augmenting out of context with global geometric features. Um, so this is, is like uh, just yeah, very different. It's just a machine learning where we uh, it's a classification. So we take um, so on the far left we can see that MRI image data and axial slice. And we would, for a particular voxel, we would sample the intensities around that voxel. And then with a the classifier, we're trying to classify to predict where the spinal cord would be and where the background would be. Um, we used, for this work, we used a random force, which has a nice property of giving you a probabilistic output, which is why we have uh, fuzzy values there. Um, so the problem with just directly uh, doing voxel-wise classification is you end up with these kind of patchy segmentations where you have a lot of false positives and false negatives. Um, previously, a couple years ago, there's an algorithm called Auto Context that tries to deal with this, uh, where it's, um, it's an iterative algorithm. And what it'll do is, instead of just using, say, uh, image information, it'll actually use the, these uh, output predictions as input to another classifier. Um, and then it'll kind of iteratively refine that cl um, classification. It'll kind of learn how to regularize um, the, se the segmentation. Um, so, so you can see that here, this is in the first iteration, it uh, gave, gave us a really rough segmentation. Mm -hmm. Second one, it, 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 there's some improvements. Um, so our contribution in this work was that we said, well, not only can we use, say, image information and these uh, predictions, we can also uh, try and incorporate higher level information where we looked at the, the connected components and tried to extract um, some sort of features from here. So you can say like, how, what's the, how big are these shapes? Uh, so then we incorporated that in this auto context framework. So not only do we include the image information, the uh, neighboring labels, we also include the information about the connected component that it belongs to. Um, so if we, so I'll show you how, uh, how this kind of works um, and why it's this is kind of a useful thing to do. Uh, in the top left hand corner, you can see the MRI. Underneath that is where a human expert has, has marked as the spinal cord. Um, so if we just look at these, these top rows here, um, this, this is without the geometric features that we proposed. Um, and you can see that that's the first iteration. Um, and then the second iteration, it, it kind of improves um, the classification. But at the final iteration, we're still left with this false positive. And if we look on a sagittal slice, we can see that it actually split the spinal cord in two, where it should just be a single connected object. Uh, when we added these global geometric features, um, it got rid of, you can see that the first iteration is the same. It starts to regularize a little bit better. Um, by the end of it, it removes the false positive, and it um, got rid of those false negatives in the middle as well. Um, so if we care, compare the results from our first method uh, up the top with the results from our updating method, or our, our machine learning approach, um, just looking at these numbers here, this, uh, if we look at the Jacquard similarities of how similar are the two images, um, we can see that we had a significant improvement using this machine learning approach. 
on multiple sclerosis patients, and over here we've noticed a similar improvement on non-MS or healthy patients. Um, yeah. So, to give a summary, uh, two, uh, we presented two spinal cord segmentation methods. Uh, the first one was the minimal passage in high dimensions, and the second one was the machine learning approach. Uh, and we can kind of conclude that at least for this specific data set, um, that the machine learning approach produces superior results. Uh, and it's our first method. And that's it. So let's thank the speaker. And as usual, we welcome questions from the audience. So anything you want to ask about spinal cord segmentation, you're welcome to address our speaker. So, anyone? Uh, okay, then, as usual, then I will ask question. And um, regarding this, uh, your research, uh, what is your database? How many MRI images you are working with to um, get these results? So we had 20. We had 20. 10 uh, healthy patients and 10 um, uh, MS patients. So mm -hmm. and those are 3D, 3D volumes. And another question, uh, how dangerous are these false positives and false negatives that might be in these, might be detected? Like um, you, you, you say that, oh, we have a broken spine or something? Oh, no, <laughs> and not really a broken spine, but the segmentation is incorrect. So uh, this, this is more that it's, it's not really usable. If we, if we have this, we can't use this to uh, really measure the cord. Um, it's not really, dangerous in the sense, uh, unless you were using this to do surgery or something, which, which is probably not quite there yet. Um, but it could give like misleading results, like maybe you think that the patient is healthier than the patient is um, because you have a poor segmentation, or, or other way around, maybe you think they're less healthy. And another thing, so regarding these uh, images, uh, what resolution do you have? It seems like those images that you show are quite low resolution. Am, am I right? Uh, yeah, well, they're uh, one millimeter cubed oh, for a voxel size. Mm -hmm. One millimeter, mm -hmm. so not terribly high, but that's, I think that's pretty typical uh, resolution size. And they're always black and white, or no? Yeah, yeah, for, uh, for MRI. Oh. Yeah. Yep. yeah uh, so we are not there to get HD image of in color? Uh, not yet, I don't think so, but. I suppose you could add, you could, you might be able to add other um, colors to it or something like that. But no, it's their, uh, their, their in, uh, the intensity information. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Okay. So let's think. Uh, thank our speaker. Thank you. Uh, okay.